Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Claudia Paz here. Uh, with me is Yuri, and we welcome you all to the session. We are delighted to have you here today to discuss the pollination in the tropics. And also, uh, we bring special guests that prepare nice presentations. And uh, we'll also be here with you, with us, right, to answer questions and chat. So except for Matthew Luskin, he's in Australia right now, crazy time zone. And uh, I'm sure you can reach him later by email or uh, through the UVA app. We first like to thank the APBC virtual meeting organizers and the community that is here this week to share knowledge and have fun as always at, at uh, ATBC. This session we work uh, with pre-prepared uh, recorded presentations. Yuri and I have uh, prepared a short video slash introduction slash presentation with some results uh, that will be followed by the talks of uh, inspiring young scientist, Dr. Christopher Byrne from University of British Columbia, Canada, Dr. Cooper Rosen from the University of Wisconsin Medicine, US, Dr. Uh, Dr. Matthew Luskin from University of um, Queensland, Australia. So stay tuned for some incredible uh, images, discoveries, uh, experiences. And um, as uh, this kind of open format session we chose, we make it, we wanted to make a bit more inter interactive. So after our introduction and presentations, uh, we prepared a quiz for our attendees to maybe instigate the debate and keep you engaged. So Yuri will explain it right now, how it's going to work. Hi everyone, this is Yuri and Claudio have to. Oh. And I will be sharing the quiz. With you in the chat during the whole session, seeing two or three questions. Uh, don't forget to click the next and wait for the next presentation. And at the end of the presentation, you will click in the submit button and we will receive all the answers. And we will show the results at the end of the session with some extra comments. So the, the link for this quiz is in the chat now. And it's on you, Claudia. Good. So I think we're ready to go. Um, let's see if there's something else to say. Uh, we, due to connection issues, maybe we ask you to close your cameras and uh, microphones, I guess, all closed right now. But uh, just keep the camera for now for the presentations closed. And then after the presentations, we open for the discussion so we can see each other and um, interact in a more, <laughs> uh, maybe less virtual way. So. Um, uh, the organization is asking to use only the Zoom chat. So if you have questions, you can use the chat at Zoom. Please don't use the WOVA app. We can see, uh, we can, uh, see the questions from here. And that's it. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy. Many tropical forests around the world are an important hotspot of biodiversity. These forests are continually treated by human pressure as urbanization, fragmentation and illegal hunting. And here in Brazil, these pressures resulted in a loss of 90% of our Atlantic forest original cover, affecting many vertebrates that are essential to keep the structure and maintenance of this forest hotspot. Unfortunately, this deformation process is also the reality for many other tropical forests. Large mammals, such as tapirs, white-lipped peccaries, 
primates, tigers, jaguars, elephants, large ungulates are disappearing from tropical biomes across the globe. This likely leads to cascading effects that change the whole system forever, but we still need to understand such consequences to mitigate negative impacts and improve the conservation actions. Here in the Brazilian Atlantic Forest, a long-term experiment was installed 10 years ago to simulate the defoliation in the rainforest. A team of researchers and students have been working in this great task of investigating the above and below ground changes caused by the loss or reduction of large mammal populations in the multi-trophic diversity, communities structure, carbon and nutrient dynamics. Hi, I'm Mauro Galetti from Sao Paulo State University. Here's our exclosure plot uh, where we're trying to simulate the extinction of large mammals in the Atlantic Forest. So what we are doing here, we exclose uh, a, a, a parcel in the forest and we measure all the seedlings and saplings uh, that are uh, growing in the forest. At the same time, we have a, another plot that's open for the animals. Uh, so with this uh, experiment, we can really measure the impact of large uh, mammal species like white-lipped peccaries or tapirs uh, are doing the vegetation. As a contribution to this project, I classified all the seedlings and saplings into six life forms, trying to understand how the exclusion of terrestrial mammals could affect this functional group over the server period. We found that herbivores modulated life form abundance in different ways between the treatments, favoring lianas in open plots while trees and palms were favored in closed plots. These changes in abundance also affected the coexistence of all six life forms. Through this change, the foundation increased the species diversity within life forms in exclosure plots. However, the diversity among life forms was negatively affected in closed plot and positively affected in open plot, increasing substantially over the 10 years of the experiment. This way, we suggested that the defoliation can affect plant life form composition and the vertical structure of the tropical forests. But, as you will see, these effects do not happen only in the above ground layer of the ecosystem. Hi! Cloud again to talk about below ground communities and show you evidence that they may also change due to loss of large herbivores. The vascular mycorrhizae of fungi, AMF, are obligate symbionts of majority of land plants. They are involved in a trade of nutrient, water and defense against root disease for carbon compounds coming from the plant. To investigate changes in AMF communities in our definition experiment, we collected soil from the plots and submitted them to DNA sequencing using specific primers to detect AMF. This resulted in 41 virtual taxa, the equivalent of a species, let's say, which is quite high diversity for this group. When looking at the distribution of this AMF taxa in three of our sites, we observed that despite similar richness between open and disclosure plots, the plots seem to differ in composition, especially where the large herbivores, widely peccaries, and tapirs are present. The first case here. However, the most significant differences in AMF richness appear between areas, with the highest being where widely peccaries are still present and abundant. The second richest is the area where large mammals are absent, suggesting that the mechanisms that explain these patterns may differ. Soil type and vegetation vary among areas, as well as the degree of degradation. Interactions between soil condition and vegetation cannot be ignored when interpreting this data. Besides potential indirect effects of fauna on soil and vegetation condition that alter AMF communities, we also wondered about direct effects of large mammals on the dispersal of AMF. To look at dispersal modes, we did a systematic review and observed that mammals can disperse AMF propagules. We also saw that large mammal dispersal is largely overlooked. As we had some fresh scat samples from widely peccaries, 
we sent them also to DNA sequencing and interestingly found out that almost all samples contain AMF DNA in them. Those are novel, exciting and unpublished findings. We continue these studies to elucidate the consequences of losing fauna for the whole system. And our work would not be possible without this special team of technicians, students, postdocs and senior researchers and the sponsor uh, agencies that contributed with scholarships and research funding. Thank you for watching. Hey, um, if you go to chat now, you can see the form for the quiz. So please answer these only two questions just to warm up. <laughs> and then soon in few seconds, we start the next presentation. And for you that uh, were not here before, we will present uh, all the, the talks, the pre-recorded talks. And then after we have, uh, for some of them, we have a, a quiz. And then we finish with presentations and we open the mic for questions, discussion, debate. And we will be able to see each other through the camera, okay? So I hope you, you have all the, the questionnaires now. So please uh, don't uh, just click next and it's going to be one page for, for presentation. So you just click next and then wait for the next presentation. And then by the end you submit your answers and we got the results immediately, okay? So let's go for the next one. Hello, my name is Dr. Christopher Byrne. I'm talking to you from the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada, from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Um, and today I'm talking on behalf of my colleagues, Andrew Whitworth, Ariana Basto, Eleanor Flatt, Matthias Tobler, George Powell and Adrian Forsyth as well. And I'm going to be talking about the implications of the disappearance of Amazonia's mega herding ecosystem engineer. So how do we typically study the implications of deformation? We might use exclosure experiments, which um, remove your focal species from what is typically a very constrained spatial area. Um, we might also use um, defaulted versus less, less disturbed um, study sites um, or landscapes, um, and that brings in all sorts of issues about um, are, is there some landscape level variation in the underlying assemblage, which makes things difficult to compare. Um, so just as a potential thought experiment, it'd be interesting to think if you could magically remove a keystone species from a, from a system at a landscape scale. And what would that mean and how might that change how we, how we understand the assemblage of um, how species uh, assemble under a deformation scenario? Enter the white lit peccary. So white lit peccaries are a um, keystone ecosystem um, engineer. They turn over soil, consume a voracious amount of seeds, seedlings and plants and animal matter. And they recycle nutrients, they create uh, microhabitats for other species. They're also an important prey for large large cats and they go around in these mega herds you know up to 200 300 even anecdotally a thousand individuals at a time um, anecdotally having a similar effect as as you know three or four savannah elephants moving through this landscape at any one time um, and there's a very interesting paper which came out well a preprint which came out by Fragoso and colleagues which documented cyclic um, boom bust cycles in the white red peccary so periods where they're hyper abundant and then after which they crash. Um, and that got us thinking, you know, maybe we can explore the implications of this, but we might need a, a particularly um, um, specific data set. And this is what I'm calling the opportunity. So camera trapping occurred in Los Amigos Conservation Concession in 2006, 2007 by Matthias Tobler. This coincided with the peak in purple of the white lip peccary um, population. Um, this um, censusing was then repeated in 2019, which coincided with one of the crashes. Um, the map I'm showing you here, the peak survey stations are shown in circles and the crash are shown in plus signs. 
So essentially what we have is a spatially replicated pre-post um, comparison, which is pretty rare um, in ecology and quite exciting. And just to prove that white lip pepper is disappeared from this landscape, um, the capture rate in the peak period was between um, 1 and 2.5 um, captures per 100 days. Um, in the crash period, we didn't record a single white lip pepper in 2019. So they truly disappeared, um, or at least as much as we know from this landscape. So we can ask all sorts of questions um, and have some expectations from this data set. One of the largest is how does the terrestrial vertebrate community respond to the disappearance of white lip peccary? And this is interesting because it's in the absence of all other stresses like habitat fragmentation, disturbance, logging, and so on. This is just the removal of a um, local community member. Um, jaguar habitat you should decrease because they're one of their key species that they prey on has disappeared. Um, collared peccary habitat you should increase um, because they're in essentially um, competition with white lip peccaries. Um, but how the other species respond is, is up for debate. All of the analyses I present are done in R in the HMSC package. So how does the terrestrial vertebrate community respond? I'll just show you a quick coefficient plot. Any species which falls below the zero line um, was detected less frequently in the, in the crash period. Any species of, which occurs above it was detected more frequently. Um, and what we can see is that typically most species were detected more frequently um, in the crash period. Um, somewhat reassuringly, the white lip peccary and jaguar were the species which were, which were declined the most. Um, and we see a fair number of species which increased. These are just coefficient plots, so we, can't, we don't get an idea of, of community composition, but we can use these coefficients to generate predictions of how we might think this community might structure. Um, and to do this, I'm going to show you a species rank plot. So basically, a species which occurs at the top of, of, of this graph is um, has the highest number of, of uh, detections um, per unit time. The ones at the bottom have the lowest rank number of detections um, per unit time. On the left-hand side, we've got the peak period, and on the right-hand side, we've got a crash. So white lip peccaries were one of the most abundantly detected species in, in the peak period, and then they became very swiftly one of the least detected species. Jaguars also showed a marked decline in their, in their rank um, abundance. Um, Pollard peccaries, as you might expect, it went from being one of the eighth um, most abundantly detected species to being the second most abundantly detected species. We also saw increases in rank abundance in rocket deer, puma, and ocelot as we might expect, as jaguar um, habitat use declines. We also found some slightly strange things, like shorter dog jumped in rank um, order, and so did Spix's guan. So some very clearly expected changes, others somewhat less so. Um, we also explored if sh these shifts were mediated by spe species traits, one of them being foraging guild. Um, we might expect that sim uh, species in a similar foraging guild to the white lip peck, we might increase the most under, under the uh, disappearance, but to date, we haven't found any significant effect of traits, but we can talk about that a little bit at the end. And I'm very open to ideas as how we can explore um, the functional implications of these community composition shifts. Um, in summary, we found marked community compositional changes, some things which we might expect, others which we might not. And we've currently not related these to any traits of any significance to date. Some of the challenges in working with this data set is its observation in, in nature and with all the issues that that brings with it. And we can talk about this afterwards. Also, the peak and the crash is perfectly confounded by the equipment which we use to survey. So the old um, camera equipment, 35 more film versus the newer um, digital trail cameras. Um, on that note, thank you very much for listening. And I'm very much looking forward to participating in the ATBC session. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, very nice. Uh, I, I can see there's no questions in the chat. I hope people are taking note of uh, their questions and we can all ask the, and interact after the presentations. So, Chris, we missed your questions in the quiz, but you yourself can <laughs> ask the questions to the public and uh, make this challenge to the attendees. And let's uh, go to the next one.
much for attending my talk. I'll be presenting some work that I've conducted in collaboration with John Polson, who unfortunately can't join us for this session. I'll be talking about work in the Afrotropics, and of course when we think of the Afrotropics, the first thing many of us think about is elephants. Elephants are among the largest and most charismatic species on Earth. Of course, we're interested in them as ecologists because they have a disproportionate effect on their forest environment, as I'll talk about. And we're interested in them as conservationists because they're under pretty extreme threat, particularly in Central African forests. They've now recently been designated their own species and are critically endangered. So any discussion of defaunation in Afrotropical forests often centers on elephants because of their role and their rate of loss. When we think about elephants, we have a conceptual model of what they do in the forest. What, what are their main contributions to, to forest ecology? What will be lost when elephants are lost? And we can think of three main categories seed dispersal, nutrient cycling, and herbivory and physical damage. And in this diagram, we show them all declining with the decline or loss of elephants. And that will have pretty significant effects on the forest environment. And we can have an idea of what the forest will look like when those things are lost. We will lose the dispersal of particularly large seeds because elephants are often the only ones eating them. So we'll lose a lot of the very largest trees, which have large seeds. We'll lose a lot of that nutrient layer in the, in the upper areas of the soil because elephants are no longer transporting and breaking down huge amounts of nutrients from the plant material they eat. And elephants are no longer there trampling and causing physical damage, so we'll have a lot more um, understory growth. Uh, seedlings, saplings, and herbaceous vegetation. So the forest is probably going to look quite a bit different. In the end, though, these are just uh, predictions. This is a conceptual model, and we want to test some of these things. So what do you need first for a test? You need a field site. This was our field site in Gabon in Central Africa. It's a, a field station called Ipasa, which is in the northern end of Ivindo National Park. And you will see uh, John and his group uh, conducted large-scale transect surveys to assess defaunation in the region, and they're color-coded here. So deep in the National Park, when you get down farther south here, we have uh, green indicating no defaunation. Up in the edge of the park, we have a, a lighter green indicating a little bit of defaunation. And near villages, and particularly in this logging concession here, we have quite a bit of defaunation. Here we have red. We'll, we'll see essentially no elephants when you get deep into the logging concession. Among the first things I noticed when I started working here was how open the understory was, how we have these uh, very large areas with no vegetation at all, where everything has been trampled. Uh, these are not human trails. These are elephant trails. And they can continue for kilometers interweaving throughout the forest. And obviously, that has a big effect on the understory and on forest structure. And I wanted to understand uh, in, a, in a, a more quantitative way what are the effects of that. So I used a model called an artificial seedling. I found that if I fed my field assistants beer and popcorn, they would make hundreds of these for me and put them all out in the forest. They're constructed of two plastic drinking straws stapled into a tee with a thick wire root. And we put them out, and then every month for, for a year, we'd go back and see whether they're damaged or not. A lot of them were damaged, and in a lot of cases, that the damage was clearly from elephants, but sometimes it was not so clear. Here's a case where it was clear. We put out a camera trap to see just what was happening. We have an artificial seedling circled in red and two foraging elephants. Don't know anything about it. And walking along, crunch. So this is essentially what happens to a natural seedling, too. If an elephant comes and a seedling is in its path, it will get crunched. Now, the question, of course, is how this artificial model translates to reality. Is this representative of natural seedlings? Well, we don't really know. So the question is, how do we isolate the effects of elephants in a more natural forest environment? We have this great artificial model. It showed us that, yes, elephants and other animals are doing quite a bit of damage in the understory. But can we identify areas with actual natural elephant activity within the forest? There are a few ways to do this. One is we could observe forests with low elephant densities. But that would come at a cost of other confounding effects. Where there are low elephant densities, there's probably also logging and hunting and other human activities. So that's not a great comparison. 
we could compare slopes to flat terrain on the assumption that John Turborg and, and his group made that elephants don't use the slopes, particularly the sleep, steep ones. Well, he found that that wasn't exactly true. Elephants did use the steep slope. So he and his group have a couple great papers on it, but they didn't get quite the distinguishing um, forest structure that they were expecting if there are really are presence and absence of elephants. So we decided to take another approach, and we wanted to identify hot spots of elephant activity in the forest. This is still an observational approach, but we're hoping to isolate areas that naturally have high elephant activity. The way we did this was by identifying what we called elephant trees, which you see here on the left. These are several species of tree that produce large fruits that um, are known to be prominent in elephant diets. The individual trees we selected were canopy level height and had visible elephant damage on the trunk. And we set up plant plots radiating out from the trunks of these trees to um, measure, uh, identify all of the seedlings, saplings, and adult trees. We compared those plant plots with similar plots around what we called our control trees. These were non-diet species, mostly wind dispersed. Elephants had no interest in, in eating the fruits or seeds. They are likewise canopy level height and at least 25 meters, but less than 200 meters from the elephant tree. And by comparing the plant plots around these elephant versus control trees, we hoped to identify elephant activity within the natural forest environment. This worked relatively well. What we'll look at first is a proportion of stems damaged. We have seedlings and saplings, and again in dark we have elephant trees, and in light we have control trees. We did find greater damage around elephant trees. You see that's true both for the seedlings and for the saplings. Significantly greater damage around elephant trees. We did not find that that translated to differences in stem density. Here we have seedlings versus seedlings saplings versus saplings, and we see essentially no difference. So while we did have greater damage, we didn't see differences in stem density between these uh, elephant trees and control trees. Next we looked at seed dispersal and the question of whether elephants are sowing seeds preferentially in these hot spot areas around elephant trees. We found that yes, elephant tree species were more abundant around elephant trees, both conspecific, you know, the same species under its, under its own canopy or a different individual of the same species, but also heterospecific. Whatever these elephants had been consuming at another tree, they were bringing into these, these new trees. So we had preferentially more uh, species, more abundance of these elephant tree species and seedlings and saplings around elephant trees. But we didn't find any difference in overall plant species diversity between the tree types. So again, this elephant activity didn't translate to observable effects kind of at this broader forest level. In summary, we found elephants can affect structure and composition of the forest through their foraging activities. But why didn't we have stronger results? We have a few ideas as to this. First, there are other confounding differences between tree types that we didn't measure at all. Many differences, probably. There are concurrent effects of apes and other large animals. We consider these to be elephant trees, but of course a lot of other animals are eating those too, and so we can't isolate the effects just of elephants. And lastly, these plants are probably a lot more resilient to damage than we expected. So when we saw damage on the artificial seedlings, and when we saw damage in the plant plots, that didn't necessarily translate to changes in seedling and sapling density or changes to forest structure. We know elephants are doing a lot, but we're only starting to scratch the surface with these observational studies. So we're thinking maybe manipulative experiments are necessary, right? As ecologists, if we, if we manipulate one or more variables, we can more clearly understand what the cause and effect is. Uh, but how can we do them? We could do a small-scale study with rodents, for example, and have exclosures for seed predation, but how do we scale that up to something the size of an elephant? Well, John Polson and his group have come up with a potential solution. They call it the elephants. And here it is. It's a very large elephant exclosure. And it's constructed of these uh, thick nylon webbing, the kind of things you might see on um, cargo straps on a large uh, semi-truck. And they're tightened with ratchets around uh, natural existing trees. They have so far stood the test of, of time and damage to elephants. They've been up for several years as a pilot study. 
Here we have evidence of its effectiveness. This is a camera trap image from inside one of the elephant exclosures. You see an adult and young elephant approaching this exclosure, inside of which is a fruiting Mamea africana. That's one of the favored fruit trees of elephants, and you see that this exclosure is effectively keeping them out. After that pilot project, John has recently acquired NSF funding for, for this experimental design here, which will be replicated um, across the national park. He has these elephant exclosures, inside of which are 50 meter by 50 meter plots, paired with control plots 100 meters away. And inside these paired plots are further exclosures, small exclosures for medium-sized mammals and even smaller exclosures for seed predators. And the hope is to really isolate the effects of these different body sizes of animals on the forest environment. And this will be the, the first true manipulation uh, of elephant effects in the Central African forest. And so this is a very exciting project. We hope to hear more about it as the project gets going. If you have any questions, please contact John Polson for more info. This is his project, and we're all excited to learn more about it. With that, I'd like to thank the many people that made this work possible. We have a long list of field assistants, as well as ANPN and Centerest for supporting the research. Thank you and the audience for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions in the discussion section following. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was amazing to see all this. Um, for the ones that just entered the room, we have a question, a quiz in the uh, chat. So please go open the forum and answer the questions. At the end of presentations, we will reveal the results. It's only two, three questions. It's quite easy. It's not an exam. There's no punishment or a prize. <laughs> it's just to warm up the discussion. And um, so we have one more presentation. And then we see the quiz together. And then we open the discussion so everybody can open the cameras, uh, raise the hand, ask questions, uh, make comments. It's going to be quite free as an open format <laughs> should be. So with you, uh, our next presentation. Hello, my name is Matthew Luskin. I'm on the faculty of the University of Queensland in Australia. And today I'm going to give you a uh, case study, fascinating case study that will explain how large wildlife can induce conspecific negative density dependence in plants and not the way you're thinking through non-trophic, non-selective interactions. Sounds cool, get ready. So normally in my lab, we work on interactions among wildlife species, the effects of apex predators on herbivores, or maybe the effect of uh, food subsidies on herbivores. And in this talk, I'm gonna focus on how herbivores can influence the tree community. So I'll really be thinking about plant animal interactions and how that affects tree recruitment. And normally we think about this through the lens of seed dispersal and seed predation, seedling trampling, which has recently been shown to be more important. Um, herbivory, and today I'll focus on sapling predation. Now, what do I mean by predation? I mean uh, any reason an animal will kill a stem, whether or not it's eating it or not. So there's where we're focused on today. So I really want to ask the question, can wildlife habitat preferences induce negative density dependence among saplings? And this is the topic of a new paper we have out this year. Where did we do this work? in Paso Research Forest in Peninsular Malaysia. There it is relative to the University of Queensland where I am, across the South America to the other side of the map there. 
So what we need to know about Paso is there's a lot of pigs. So we recorded the number of pig nests in the forest, which is a really good measure of how many reproductive females there are at any given time. We saw this huge variation over a 20 year period. And what explained that is a, the um, presence of oil palm fruit in the landscape. The pigs are crop raiding at night outside the forest. And this is a food subsidy that is totally driving their populations. Now, a key thing that wild boar do, a key interaction is they make nests. And each one of these nests can contain 250 stems or more. Many of those are saplings, tree saplings. Now that's important because those tree saplings show up in the Smithsonian's forest geo network tree plots. So this can amount to a 50 hectare tree plot losing up to 60,000 saplings over a 25 year period, which we calculated from our work. Now in a previous study, what we did is we looked at the change in tree saplings over this 25 year period. And what we found is a huge loss in tree sapling abundances between 1986, that's in the green and the yellow, that's 2010, huge decrease in abundance, but there was a 25% increase in species evenness. And that really threw us and it sent me down a rabbit hole and a series of other studies trying to figure out what was going on. So pigs reduce sapling abundance, but increase evenness. How is that possible if pigs are generally not selective and they're probably not targeting common species? Well, what if wildlife disturb habitats that happen to have common species? And tree species in larger habitats will just have a larger population, all else equal. And so if pigs nest in common habitats, they'll end up killing the common species, even though it's just a fact of where they, um, where they uh, had their habitat preferences. And this could indirectly induce conspecific negative density dependence. I'll show a quick schematic of how this works. If this is our habitat in the forest plot, which it is, and let's just say we had 20% of these first three habitats and 40% of the orange. And let's just say tree densities were directly um, related to their um, preferred habitat in that plot. Well, let's say pigs come through and they actually only like to make nests in this orange area. Well, that could lead to a higher mortality rate for common species in the common habitat, even though the mechanism was pigs uh, preferring that habitat type. So these are the actual location of pig nests. They are way more common in the orange habitat. At the start of our study, we tagged 35,000 stems. These are tree saplings between one and two centimeters DBH. Five years later, recorded how many died, almost 9,000. Um, over 1,500 of those were tree tags that we actually recovered from within the nest. So we were positive that the pigs killed them. And that represented 19% of saplings killed in the entire study. We also looked at where saplings, the habitat preferences. And so what this graph is showing is the color code relating to this uh, map on the left of where saplings that were used in pig nests came from. And you can see a predominance of orange in this orange habitat, which is the low flat habitat. And this is a habitat that is unfold. Flooded. So low, flat, unflooded habitat. That sound also looked at tree species abundances and they're correlated, strongly correlated with the area that that habit, that that tree uh, preferred. And so what we ended up with is conspecific negative density dependence just because of the habitat choices the pigs were making. So one final graph here is this is showing the sapling density initially when the, when the um, uh, study started. And we have it separated into quadrats that are 20 by 20 meters. And we separated this into quadrats that eventually had pig nests. And so what we see in this graph is initially pigs preferred to nest in areas that had higher stem densities. This makes sense if you're trying to make a nest, you want more materials with which to make it with. We also started with species evenness being lower in the quadrats that pigs eventually nested in. So they're choosing quadrats with high density and low species, rich, uh, species evenness. By the end of the study, because pigs had um, disturbed so much of the sapling community, we see that the sapling density is no longer differs between areas with and without pig nests. 
but there was an increase in sampling evenness that was 50% more in the quadrants that had pigs. Now, is this unique? No, when we look at a meta-analysis of um, exclosure studies done across the world, what we find is the presence of large wildlife increases speech plant species evenness. So the pattern that we observed at PASO and the mechanism, we are not stating that that is either common or um, present in other sites, but it is representative of a larger trend where the presence of large wildlife increases the species evenness of the site. So to summarize, at our site, we had a high propensity of wild boar eating oil palm, making nests, killing tree saplings. And we found that yes, this did induce conspecific negative density dependence because the pigs liked to nest in the dominant habitat type. Now, if the pigs had preferred to nest in one of the rare habitat types, the opposite effect could have been observed. We could have seen a decline in species richness or a, or a higher mortality rate for the rarer species. So our effects are totally dependent upon the area of our plot that happened to be uh, a preferred nesting site for pigs. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. And for more information, please uh, refer to this paper and proceedings of the Royal Society of Biology. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. He's not here with us uh, at this time because he's in Australia, but I'm sure you can uh, reach him through the app or send him an email to discuss these themes. And um, we just discovered we had a problem with the chat. It wasn't um, open for everybody. And so if you, now it's open, if you wanna send your question, you can do it through the chat. We try to read them all, but uh, we can all um, now open our cameras and um, start this um, question and answer uh, time. And um, so please, we want to see your faces. <laughs> I think it, it would be very nice. Thank you very much, all the speakers. It's um, it's amazing what you do, and uh, we're very happy to have you here to discuss this today. So yeah, if uh, uh, we discussing now about the results of the quiz, so if, if you still have time to answer, and we decided to to have more time for discussion here at this time because you we probably now have. 15 minutes for the questions. Uh, we will reveal the um, results for the quiz later today in this um, extra session we open for beer nibbles, chat and et cetera. <laughs> so please, uh, if you guys have questions, now is the time. We have a question. We have some questions here for Christopher. Uh, there's a question here in the chat. Christopher, uh, the sound was a bit bad, but I think I heard HMSC. Could you dive a little deeper in how you use HMSC to incorporate uh, biotic interaction? Did you consider a uh, temporal overlap or just a spatial overlap? It was camera trap, yes. Chris? Thank you. Um, I, can, I can unmute now. Um, yeah, great, great question. Um, in this particular in this particular project, I've not uh, dove too deep into so into HMSC. So um, HMSC is a really cool and really powerful framework to analyze multi-species assemblages. So that makes it really nice for um, tropical systems where you have really where you have high diversity. And one of the great things about it, and one of the things that um, really attracted me to it, was when I was working in in multi-species assemblages and 
and running single species models, it just, it didn't feel right. You know, I wanted to incorporate um, information from other species. So I highly advise if you've not heard of the hierarchical modeling of species communities package in R, check it out. There's a great textbook that comes with it as well. And one of the nice things about it is you can, can, you can um, throw in a, a series of fixed effects that represent important drivers in, in the species that you're, that you're exploring. And then any of the variation left over, you can explore if there's, if there's correlations between species. Um, and it, one of the things driving this could be, could be co-occurrences between species. It could potentially even be interactions between species if certain conditions are met. Um, and, but you've got to be very, quite careful in how you interpret those. Um, that was a really good question because in, in this particular project, this is really fresh analysis and I've not dug into the, the species residual co-occurrences yet. Um, but hopefully, um, yeah, they could, they could reveal some interesting patterns. So, you know, when peccaries are present versus when they're not, that might change how some other species interact with one another. We might expect that co-occurrence um, patterns will change. Um, but unfortunately, sorry, Sean, um, like I say, this is, this is super new. So I haven't, I haven't dug into that too much yet, but watch this space, hopefully before the, uh, before the, the final draft. Sorry if that's a little um, a little frustrating as an answer. Great. Um, I just want to ask the the technicians if uh, we need to unmute, unmute people or each one can do it. Do you want to try that? Because I don't I just, know as whole. I just unmuted both uh, both speakers. I don't know if you want to let. Um... Yeah, because if we want people to speak, we need to let them unmute them <laughs> themselves. Okay, they should Is be that able possible? to do that now. Yeah, they yeah, should be able cool. to do that. Cool. Thank you. No problem. So we have another um, question from the chat, and then I I open the the mic from um, uh, from the audience. So speakers, it's general for all, all of you. Thank you, uh, enjoyed learning about the studies. I was wondering if there is any study on effects of defonation on herbs, especially amphibians affected by uh, critid. Anyone want to answer that? I, I don't know anything about it, but I saw in the chat um, that uh, another uh, attendant uh, answered this Amanda Subaluski with a with a link here, so that looks good. Check the the chat there for a link. Oh yeah, I did. I don't know anything beyond that. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and yeah, I, cool. You um, also suggested that we take it on for discussion. Oh, my video is yeah. You uh, also suggested that we take it on for the discussion. So thanks. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. For, thanks for the answer. So, what's next? Uh, there are two questions in the chat for me, so if that's all right, I'll just address them. Yeah, sure. Go um, ahead. And then we have a hand from Nacho Villar and Maira Cardoso. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'll yep. write down your names and then you're going to be next. Okay. Well, I have a question from Nacho here in the chat. Uh, he says, elephant trees are fruiting trees preferred by elephants, right? Uh, yeah, that's true. Is there anything particular about those trees? Do they produce vast amounts of fruit or a particular time of the year? Or are they more nutritious or larger? Yeah, I just think they're, I think that's it. They're just big. They're big fruits and they're, and elephants really like them. And, and th those, those big fruits attract other animals too, but they're really big fruits. And so elephants are kind of the primary consumer for a lot of them, primary disperser for a lot of them. So nothing particular other than just producing really big fruits. Um, Can I just add to that? Can yeah, please, Chris. Because I've been in. I've been. Chris in has worked site. in the same place. Yeah, <laughs> on those elephant exposure plots, which is it's really <laughs> great to see the the work being done. Um, but you've you've got to see it to believe it. Like when I went out to the Afrotropics in Gabon, when the gambaya trees started fruiting, all of a sudden the elephants came in, and it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable to see. They're so attuned to these resources. Um, and I think, yeah, with, without seeing it, I was kind of like, well, are they going to find these resources? But yeah, 
they know what's going on and they find these trees and they've probably visited them before in in previous years so it, it's it's amazing to see yeah those um <clears throat> the elephant trail that i showed <clears throat> those are interweaving and they connect and they've been mapped in other places by other studies and and they just they just go from fruit tree to fruit tree and these elephant groups certainly have a memory of these places and probably a memory of the times too and they and in addition to them just being able to sort of smell them and sense them they have this memory of okay well this is where i went and i ate really well last year so i'll follow these same trails so they're there's i wouldn't call them permanent trails but they're certainly persistent a lot of them as well because they're used over and over again to visit the same trees same times a year uh, there's another question for me that this next one in the chat so i'll continue on that and maybe chris can chime in too but uh the question is out of Dispersal trampling or nutrient cycling, do you think that there is one aspect that elephants affect the most in forests? And what are the knowledge gaps that you think are most important when considering elephants' effect on forest structure and diversity? Uh, well, that's a tough question. I mean, these are three big ones and they're big animals. And so they have a huge effect. You know, Chris has done some of the work on seed dispersal. He could comment on that a little more. The work I did was on, was on the sort of physical damage and herbivory. So I'm going to say it's herbivory and physical damage because these animals are huge and they eat a huge quantity of vegetative material. And they also damage stuff just kind of by walking around and pushing stuff out of the way they can pull down really pretty large trees. I mean, maybe not big adult trees, but they can pull down, you know, juvenile trees, saplings, easy, boom, done, gone. And they're just stepping on, on seedlings. And the question of, you know, how much every step they take, is that killing a seedling? Probably not, but definitely damaging them. And through repeated trampling, they're killing them. So I'm going to say it's this just use of the environment and the huge quantities of vegetation that they eat in addition to all the fruit. Chris, you want to chime in? You have a different answer? Uh I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make the case for seed dispersal um, because I, I, followed, I followed the elephants. We fed them false uh, fake seeds, little plastic pellets. And we find it takes around about between 20 and 72 hours, perhaps even more for these seeds to pass through their digestive system. And in that time, they're kind of displacing up to 10 kilometers a day. On average, it's a little bit lower, but the potential for, for long distance dispersal in, in the in forest elephants is absolutely ginormous. So I'm not sure there's, particularly because the seeds are so big, you know, birds are not gonna be carrying these seeds, right? So there is a unique niche that, that, that these forest elephants are doing. And if they're pulled out of the system, there's fundamental gonna be huge changes in seed shadows as well. So I'll just make the case for that too. <laughs> Cheers, yeah, to people. totally agree with Chris. I mean, there's there's nothing like them that will eat these huge seeds and transport them really long distances. There's nothing like them. Uh, what knowledge gaps do you think are most important when considering elephants' effect on forest structure and diversity? Um, there's a lot of knowledge gaps. It's surprising with how how charismatic they are. They're very difficult to study in the forest environment. And if you talk to people who study elephants in savannas or more open areas, it's like, well, you can see them all the time. There they are it's really hard to even just find them and it's really hard to watch them. So you use gamma traps and you use, you know, Chris mentioned this, this artificial uh, seed, we use artificial seedlings. And now John Polson and his group have this current uh, study of this large scale, scale exclosure. I think that will hopefully address a lot of these knowledge gaps all at once, but it's, it's a big challenge to, to study this really large charismatic animal because they're in dense forests and it's sometimes hard to even find them. Oh, I was muted. Great. Um, I have uh, Maida. Did you ask your question? You muted. Uh, can uh, someone unmute Maida? No. Just if you if you want a sideshow, Marcus is. Um, she is uh, unmuted. He's currently okay. um, corralling She's a couple unmuted. of kids. It's quite funny. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Much much better. Well, uh, first I, I just want to congratulate all of you. It's a very interesting work you've been developing, and then. Well, we know the importance of exclusion experiments to know actually the the. How, how 
these species are working on the environment. But most of the real cases that actually happens on nature, uh, these species are being excluded by uh, anthropogenic uh, reasons. So why not to consider these anthropogenic areas as well? I can I can speak a little bit to that, and I I think that's um, a really great point, and it's it's probably something that's not been doing being done quite enough at the minute. Um, and just as another heads up for for John's project um, that he recently got NSF funding for, he he's doing these exclosure experiments along a gradient of anthropogenic disturbance as well. The disturbance in Gabon is it's not as intense as in in other areas of the tropics, so I think. If they were replicated in other other areas, that that'd be huge. But I certainly think there's going to be an interactive effect um, between anthropogenic disturbance and the effects of, of different animals as well. So I do think that's a it's a very important thing to consider, and it should be a part of of any uh, any um, study moving forward to get that anthropogenic influence in there too. But it, it, it's it is challenging. Um, and to get enough replicates and then capture a, a, a gradient as well um, can be tough, but it should be done. Cool. Thanks for the answer. Um, guys, unfortunately, time is very fast. I cannot believe it's one, one hour already. So um, I'd like to thank you all for attending and participating. I think uh, if you have further comments and questions, you can use the app or uh, talk with the speakers directly. We have later today another room session. We can uh, continue the discussion. And uh, tomorrow, I just want to advertise the uh, zoochemistry session led by our colleague Nacho Villar and Elizabeth Lehut. Tomorrow, 1.20 uh, event time. So I'm sure you're gonna uh, learn uh, and learn a lot and have lots of fun. So please uh, join us later today, bring a beer or a coffee or whatever. And we continue these uh, conversations after all. Thank you very much, you all. It's been great.